What we want to do today is talk about uh, our company uh, and the enterprises that grew out of International Harvester. Um, in the last two conferences, we talked about products, and there's some amazing products that evolved over time, uh, and you know a lot about them. You're going to go see them today and tomorrow. But this session today, Tom really brought this up, and he calls it truly international. And it's a story about how the company grew and the amazing growth that occurred, uh, primarily in the period of 1850 uh, through the end of that century, but we take it all the way to 2017. <coughs> so this information uh, is based on research that we got from the archives in, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, as you may know, the McCormick uh, archives, the IH collection, uh, is there. It's an amazing collection of, uh, Tom can tell you more about it, but it's, it's been there a long time. Uh, our goal is to present the, uh, this information and, and information we've learned from some of the better experts about this growth. Uh, uh, we're, so basically we're going to talk about how that occurred and uh, the people that were involved. And there's some really interesting backstories about uh, that stuff that happened. Uh, we first of all like to thank the McCormick International Harvester Collection team in Wisconsin. Sally Jacobs is not here this morning. She'll be here tomorrow. She's working, but uh, she was kind enough to come and join us. Uh, she is the archivist that keeps track of that stuff. Uh, so if you're ever in Madison and you're an IH enthusiast, you'll want to stop there. It's an amazing place. Uh, so again, as I said, most of the images are from the Wisconsin Historical Society and some of our friends that Tom and I tapped. Uh, now, a little bit about the growth. You know, the company, as you all know, uh, the first factory was built in Chicago. Anybody remember the year that happened? The first large factory, in, actually in North America, that used standardized parts, interchangeable parts, was in 1848, when Cyrus moved from Virginia Steel Staff in Virginia to Chicago. And uh, this chart depicts uh, not only did those machines travel all over the world because of the demand for the Reaper, but we also employed immigrants from Europe that came in. And you can see the groups of immigrants here, the Irish in the first period from 1820 to 1840, the Germans in 1860 to 1900, Swedes from 70 to 1900, the Poles and Italians and so on. So it sh these, these groups, uh, you know, merged into our, uh, assimilated into the IH and the American culture, uh, and really became part of the Industrial Revolution and all the other industrial explosions that occurred in America. So this is a really nice graphic that shows the movement of machines and people. Uh, that's what the world economy is all about. Uh, this is a recurring theme that we have that you'll hear Tom talk a lot about. Uh, how did this happen and what were their aspirations of the McCormick's? Uh, but basically, uh, this is an amazing graphic here, what I'm telling you about. You know, this session I hope you enjoy, but I can promise you that you will enjoy the graphics. The graphics are just amazing. There's the artwork. If one of the things that the McCormick's were famous for was doing ads and really creative artwork. That, and so, and Tom has a real eye for it. So when he sees it, he pretty much stops, and we concentrate on that piece in the picture. But it, this is a good example of uh, some pretty amazing hard work. Um, in 1898, 23% of the McCormick Harvesting Company's business was sold beyond the U.S. Now, um, that really is amazing because if you can imagine uh, currency exchange, there were no computers, everything was on spreadsheets. I really have no idea how they did it, but there were some really smart people around. You know, there were two brothers, Leander and William Sanderson, that uh, pretty much joined Cyrus in Chicago. But they did some amazing things to enable this business to grow like they did. And it's more than just making great machines. Uh, it was the business of the transporting and boxing and packaging. And, uh, so why did it happen? Why did they grow beyond the U.S.? There's basically six reasons. A, the Reaper patent was not extended. In 1848, Cyrus was a real um, 
He was a progressive-minded businessman, but he enjoyed a monopoly. He enjoyed uh, having a protected business, as we all would. But the government said, no, your patent's not going to happen, so you basically have to compete. And he had enough production capacity in Chicago to go well beyond the demand of the U.S. And at the time, uh, the, the late end of the century, when this started manifesting itself, uh, uh, Harvester had about 85% of the business. So, you know, by anyone's measure, it, it was pretty much monopoly. I mean, anybody that he couldn't beat, he bought. Just to be candid about it. Number two, he had enough capacity in 1850. He, he knew the plant could grow. He was doing 1,600 reapers a day. And uh, you'll see some changes that are coming here. And there were 38 wheat producing countries that needed mechanized farming. And by the way, I'm going to plant a test question right here that you can be thinking about. Uh, which country in the world, in uh, let's say in about uh, 18, late 1800, 1890s, which country do you think produced the most wheat in the world? Russia. And the second no. host. Huh? And the second host. Well, no, I'm into that. The, the most producing, uh, the highest producing country was the U.S. It wasn't anything like it is today, but it was still number one. Now, what I want you to think about is who's number two. I'm not going to tell you who it is, because you'll never guess who the number two country was in the late 1800s. But you're going to learn it in a little bit. And it may become a test question from which you can earn a prize. <laughs> so now I know you'll listen to me. Uh, the other reason that we had to expand was we had, there were major crop failures in Europe in the late 1840s. Uh, farm workers were moving to the cities because there were greater efficiencies needed to feed people. Uh, and the other, one other reason, pretty major reason, was the competition. There were major competitors. By 1850, there were 30 reaper makers. By the end of the century, there were 300. By the time the company was incorporated in 1902, there were over 300, uh, many of which, the good ones, were consolidated into what we now know as IH. Uh, and then the last reason, there was widespread notoriety because of the way McCormick promoted his product all over the world. Um, that started in 1851. He did ex exhibitions, uh, expositions, and, and had lots of awards. We have a nice, uh, if you've been to the World Headquarters in Chicago, we have all the medals are there that he won in Paris and all over the world. And uh, that was probably pretty, a lot of his passion was to win that, and he played a, played a personal role in doing that. Uh, I talked about capacity. Tom found this chart, and we have it on the easel up front there, so if you, at the end then you can take a look. It's really another amazing piece of artwork that shows the production numbers and how they grew from the, the time the plant opened until the end of the uh, 1800s. So you can see it grew really big. Now what that means is they got really creative about how to make machines. And making machines like in these numbers, economies of scale exploded. That's how these guys made money, the Henry Fords and the Cyrus McCormick's. The, probably the last 50,000 of those 76,000 machines were free. Everyone he sold was pure cash because he had, already, he had so many economies of scale. He controlled his production supply line. You know, he, he brought his wood in. He, brought his, he, he made his own iron. Uh, he controlled his supply chain. And he was the first really to do that. Um, I'm talking about. Well, the, down below, above, they're showing ships going to four corners yes. of the world, and yes. below, trains going to every part of the U.S. Yes. Yeah. Check that out a little later. So here is showing the, of course, the uh, use of trains in the in domestic sales, and then we use ships for what we call CKD. You might know what CKD means. Come on, CKD, knockdown goods, complete knockdown. All right, that was the phrase we used. But they put those stuff, and you'll see pictures, Tom will show you a minute, they're in a big crate. You know, you think today how neat it is that Amazon, right, ships stuff. Uh, Cyrus was doing it in the late 1800s, and, and, and really sophisticated stuff. He shipped complete machines in a box. But uh, Tom's right, this shows Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, this one shows ships to England, France, Italy, Russia, and South America. So there was huge demand worldwide for what he was making. Uh, Cyrus and Junior, you know, they're Cyrus the original, 
was born in 1809, he died in 1884. His son took over then and uh, had the aspiration to join up with Deering. Uh, and he finally did that. They tried in the late 1800s and didn't work. They tried again with the help of J.P. Morgan and it happened in July 28th of 1902. That was a big day for our company. Uh, their mission was greater than building farms. They liked to make money and they liked to grow like all entrepreneurs did and still do today. But they had a major effect on doing that uh, by building greater, uh, better farm equipment and feeding the world. And their concept was to bring modern civilization to the uncivilized regions of the world. And they were, they were everywhere. I mean, the, the, the need for that to happen was virtually everywhere on the planet. So, uh, and of course, they had the, the means to do that. Uh, they called it a world defined by the haves and the have-nots of technology. So if you had it, you could win. If you didn't have it, you might start with it. So it was fairly revolutionary. This is a spreadsheet that we found in the archives. And again, you know, in living in today's world, with the digital world, everything's on the computer. But to think, they had spreadsheets where they literally had this stuff laid out and doing it by pencil. Uh, it's just astounding to me. But the numbers here are huge. I can't remember which one it was. I think it's France. Um, yeah, four and a half million. Four and a half million pieces of product. This is in uh, 1898 to 1908. So it was it was a huge. I mean, you look at today, Microsoft and Apple, they're huge, right? I mean, they're really huge. Uber. Um, this is sort of the Uber of the day, if you think about it. Microsoft. Um, so after the merger of 1902, there were five companies, two huge and three smaller ones. The two huge were Deering and McCormick. Uh, the company began to uh, purchase and build facilities. And the first one we built was in Hamilton, Ontario. And it's a massive, massive facility. Now Tom's going to show you country by country uh, those plants. And when you see that graphic, it's, it'll knock your socks off. That was a huge undertaking. Uh, we actually stopped doing business in Canada because we were prohibited, because we weren't making it there. You know, the local content rules that countries have, even back then. Tom will tell you more about that. Uh, this, uh, then the next one was in Sweden. Uh, it's pronounced Norshapig. Norshapig. You know, there's a, there's a website that you put the word in, it'll tell you how to pronounce it, which is a wonderful thing for a boy from Kansas. <laughs> I could not pronounce that word. Uh, Lubersky is the other word from Russia, was the third plant. And of course, Neuss, Germany, was a pretty famous plant. Uh, I think it closed in the 90s. K stopped using it in the 90s. But, and there's some really astounding stories about the Neuss plant in World War II. There's a person Tom will probably tell you about that was in the plant, and Brooks McCormick, the last McCormick to run International Harvester, asked this man to chronicle his experiences at the plant. And they're pretty amazing, pretty amazing in World War II, what was going on there. So uh, these are the pretty much the expansion that occurred right after the incorporation uh, from 1905 to 1911. Uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, so, uh, oh, the other thing is when, when these plants got up and going, they produced more than they needed in their own country. So they exported to other countries. So Sweden was shipping product to Russia. Doncaster shipped a product to Australia. Three plants in Australia, which were also huge, were, were producing uh, for eight <coughs> countries, including the ones you see here in New Zealand, South Africa, East Africa, and so on. I mean, the Australian operation was unbelievable. It was huge. Um, so they, it was a, sort of a multi-distribution concept, not just from the U.S. to there, or plants over there that furnished their own country. Once they started building, they fanned out into other countries because they became clean and efficient and uh, it worked. These are some of the foreign subsidiaries. Uh, McCormick had country managers, that ran, and these guys were gods. I mean, they were literally gods. They ran the business. They decided who would sell it, Decided to hire the fire, they could even probably make their own product. In fact, some of the products is unique. Uh, they, they were major news. There's 24 uh, subsidiaries there. Actually, there's more than that. 32. 32. Yeah, 32. 
Um, and these are uh, other assembly plants that you can see how big Australia was. And again, Tom's going to go through each of these. And you can see what they were producing and how long they did it. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big list. Uh, more on the assembly plants. Uh, Bedford, Doncaster was a huge plant made in what we call worldwide tractors, the, the smaller tractors, uh, smaller than the farm all. We had a, a joint venture with uh, Kimco, uh, IH Komatsu, until 84. So we made some tractors over there. Uh, Satio, and you can see them all there. This is a 70s chart. Uh, just to show how big it got, you can tell by looking uh, where all the plants were. There was a big concentration in the U.S. of course. Well, North, I should say North and South America. But we had a lot of plants in, in uh, you know, Croy and Yambo and Noyce, a lot of them in Europe and Australia. So now I'm, uh, Tom's going to get into a little more detail and a few more of the backstories on each of the plants. This has been something I've been working on in my head for a long time. In 2011, I was asked to do a book, design and write a book for Navistar. I actually started out for the wives of the board of directors. They wanted a quick little history book. So I did a 48-page book, 12 inches square, and it kind of chronicled the history of the company. Um, one of my spreads in the middle of the book, I called Truly International, and I tried to explain on two pages, how far this company extended itself. Um, and from there, I've always wanted to do this. I've never had good answers. This is an incomplete study. This we worked on this since November. We went to the archives and worked with Sally and her team three times, um, and we still are better than scratching the surface. But this is far from complete. If you look at any of those lists, there are plants up there, joint ventures that were, are missing. Um, some of the stories, we know we were there. We don't know exactly when we got to each country or when we left, but it's it's an amazing story. Uh, we, Vaughn was showing this to one of our senior VPs, one of the top manager, management guys at Navistar, who worked in global operations for much of his career. And he didn't know some of these stories, some of these places. So it's, I, I especially in the Far East, I had no idea when we went there and how long we stayed and how we got there, how we did it. But, and what's right about the photos in here, I'll bet in the show there's uh, 50 or 70 photos that nobody's seen for 50 or 70 years. I mean, it's, they've just been in boxes preserved in the archives and some of them are just remarkable. Some of them just, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. We've got a lot of words here. Um, so I'm, these country stories are in a random order. We tried different ways of organizing them, and it didn't. none of them really made any sense. So we've got big ones and small ones. Some of them are 10 slides, and some are one slide. Um, Australia was one of our biggest operations, obviously. We had three plants there. We built construction equipment, trucks, and uh, tractors. Um, and different, as we studied um, these countries and how we got there, different patterns, recurring patterns appeared. Um, one of them was that we, we, we'd always go into a country, send in an agent, uh, start selling equipment, and see how much we could grow the business. Both in Canada and Australia, the government saw our success and then imposed a tariff on imported goods. So the really the only answer there um, is to manufacture inside the company. So we, we did that in both these places. In, in Canada, we actually left for a long time and then went back when we were ready to buy a plant or build a plant. But in Australia, we went pretty much at it to build a plant as soon as we could. Um, you know, we, back as far as 1852, if you can imagine this, we were in Australia. Um, we kept, like you did in Europe, McCormick would enter competitions um, and win. And that, it's brand building today is what we would call that. It. But it's, you 
know, without the internet, without television, how do you market yourself and you, you win prizes? That he would print a, a local flyer, a black and white flyer, um, showing a medal like that, and you know, have his agents uh, circulate it. Uh, um, so Deering was also over there fairly early on, um, and we we were by 1904 we were the kings over there. So we started selling equipment by other American makers. We were selling John Deere equipment in Australia, which just boggles my mind. But so we built uh, an assembly plant um, in Spotswood. Um, we formed the big company, the IH of Australia in 1912. Um, you know, the, the, the import duties forced us to really manufacture. Uh, and, and as soon as we had our first plant up and running, at the beginning of World War II, the government took it over, the Australian government took it over to build the uh, ferry bombers in our plant. So, you know, it was always a struggle. It wasn't, you know, today, I've worked with a lot of MBAs and they form a strategic plan and then you go execute the strategic plan and things go as it should. Well, you know, nothing ever seems to be simple, but it did work. So this is where we were, so these came in in kits, as Vaughn was saying, and they, they would be, the tractors would be assembled there. And we were really good at those kits or those crates were so small, I don't know how you get it. Like we've got a photo here of some mowers and reapers and boxes that are less than four foot by four foot or something. Crazy small. This is our harvester house, our management office, distribution center. Um, and this, we, we covered this earlier, but this just amazes me that we distributed from Australia to 80 other countries. So uh, just imagine, I mean, that's like, that's a Chicago on the other side of the world, basically. You know, uh, but, you know look at the dealerships. Look at, look at, I mean, this was no small operation. This is, I mean, obviously Australia is huge, but uh, it just, we were, and, and, and as we were here, we had dealerships, you all know that better than I, we had dealerships every five miles, because you, you, know, you weren't gonna get in your truck and drive 70 miles down to the next dealership to pick up your equipment. You were gonna take your wagon to town and buy some things. Um, this is the G-Long plant in 48. Um, the numbering system, the naming system, and I learned this from Sarah Tomac, if you know her, our Australian expert. Um, they put an A in front of everything. That's a numbering system, like Sally said last night, that I could have developed. It, it was built in Australia, there was an A in front of everything, name-wise. Um, and we built everything over there. <coughs> and just such beautiful scenery. Uh, here, this is before our plant was built. So this is at that distribution center, but we were assembling trucks. But look at this, how is it coming down the line on a little dolly pulled by our rope? I mean, this wasn't the Henry Ford assembly line just yet. I think he was simulating because the man's wearing a suit. I yeah. <laughs> But the plants were big. I don't know what that is. That's a. I love the, the that truck style there. Look at that slope <laughs> back end. That's whatever that is. We didn't make that in the U.S. Um, we had a construction plant over there. Construction equipment. This I think you all know the Echo series trucks with the butterbox front end. Um, and I, I keep putting these two images together and I keep getting told by the experts, by Sarah Tomac, that that's, that the military truck that we built for the Australian government looked like our commercial truck, but really was a ground up build for the military. But uh, pretty amazing that, you know, they hired an American company to build for them. And they, they would create their own grills over there. They would do some styling on their own. Um, most of the sheet metal was of our design, but they would hire a local, they'd have Chevrolet or somebody over there to design a, a front end for them. You know, we built big tractors over there. 
uh, as recently as 2012, we were building these uh, 9800s over there. Well, we were assembling over there. Over there, we were they were built in in Brazil, kitted in Brazil. But even even at, very recently, kitted trucks going overseas. Today, uh, all, almost almost all of that is we drive them onto a big ship and drive them off. Um, we had a deal with Caterpillar, I think some of you know about. Uh, for a few years, we designed trucks for them and sold them in Australia. Today, we have a new um, partnership with Ibeco over in Australia. And this is just 2017 new. Um, obviously, Vaughn was looking at that graphics and designed all our trucks. Well, they're not. They sell, they sell our ProStar over there and some of our other trucks, but not, and they also sell all the Ibeco trucks. Um, Canada, um, so the, the way it started, we were having dealers from New York go over the border into Canada and sell, um, and then, then the government put a, a $15 tariff on each machine, and McCormick said, okay, sell what you've got, sell your current inventory and come home, we're, we're done here. And he held out forever. I mean, he held out for 40 years or something. Then we went back and purchased the Hamilton plant and upgraded it. Um, later, the Chatham plant. Uh, but look at this Hamilton plant, the largest agricultural implement works in the British Empire. <coughs> and it looks like it is. And on that, on that spreadsheet earlier, from whatever it was, 1898 to 1908, um, they referred to Canada on there uh, as British North America. You know, that, that's what it was. It was um, so this is another view of the Hamilton plant. Just monstrously large. I'll go through some of these facts, but, but you know, you know, the, the founder here is just crazy they're making wheels look and they're you know cast in sand it looks like i mean this is like to me this is like the sculpture guys in art school what i do you know? not on this scale obviously Same kind of work. Uh, a twine mill it's one of the coolest twine mill photos i think i've seen anywhere um, these are where our branch houses were the collector that maybe some of you know george kirkham up in lethbridge look back in 1928, in Lethbridge, Alberta, there there was a branch house. So he's 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 been there. The company's been there for a long, long time. Um, Chatham plant, again, not exactly Henry Ford style, but we're making trucks uh, and so many scenic photos. Just you know, these are from the old eight by ten glass negative. Just amazing. Dealerships. There you can see, I think you can see in the middle there a cream separator. This makes me crazy. This is a, look at that grill. That's from a C model truck. But it looks like it's just glued on. It's like they just <laughs> screwed it onto an existing bus and we'll call it ours. I, I don't know what that, we, we must have, Juan and I were talking, it must, we must have built the, the chassis and the, the drive train. It, it, a lot of that must be ours. but. That's a goofy look of us. Um, here, 1910. Look at that one tractor over here on the far right. 45 horsepower tractor is pulling one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, eight or ten wagons. It's just, just crazy. Yeah. I mean, come on. That just the, the, the magnitude of that. The, the, um, this is a little more modern stuff, but you know we had that brand, the Pacific Trucks, and uh, we built, we bought this company, built trucks, kind of like they were making. Didn't I think maybe we brought in our cab or something to those trucks. Um, this is what they look like, uh, just big, heavy-duty trucks. Um, in Hamilton, and most people think of Hamilton as just a farm implement plant, but. We built trucks, not only built big trucks like this, we built small trucks there. The, the, the one on the left um, is our friend George Kirkham's restoration. Um, and those were trucks with Rolls-Royce engines 
I've never, until that, I've never heard of us <coughs> putting a Rolls Royce engine in any of our trucks, but it's true, we did. And that truck, you know, runs like it's brand new. George is, uh, why are all the, the master collectors named George? I'm still working on that. But the, the Tackaberries, the Mitchells, and the Kirkhams yeah. are, it's true. my middle name is George, but I don't think I've earned that. There you go. No, nah, not quite. Um, Chatham. Crazy cool photos. This is one I, I am the, the executive decorator at F Star. I, this is, I put it, this photo in the chairman's office on a wall among you know, 10 other photo groupings, but I, I love that photo. Um, cargo stars in the 80s. Um, and this just recently, I mean, we closed the Chatham plant now, but you know, we were building modern trucks in that same plant that we bought ages and ages ago. Our military trucks, we sold a lot to the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, it's kind of cool. We have these sometimes sitting in the lobby, but you can see them close up. And that's, uh, they're just those military trucks that the, the armor plate on them is an inch thick steel or something. I mean, it's just, they must, you know, when we built that front end of Navistar, where we have an area for displaying trucks, they really had to reinforce that ground because these things are not lightweight. Um, Egypt, who the thunk it? We were in Egypt. I don't know, I don't have a record here of when and how long, and, but from um, Craig Swanson, the video guy you probably know uh, from Farmington Implement, you know his videos. Um, he sent me some stills. Uh, so that's the Pyramid of Giza in Egypt, and there's one of our S series trucks. Here's a, a billboard in Egypt. I just, I, I'm fascinated by this stuff. Here's a dealership of ours in Cairo. I mean, who, it went, you know, truly international, that's my point. We were everywhere. I asked, we have a lawyer who works with us on history, yeah, corporate. Um, he works with the archives, funding them. And, and I, I said, Jeff, Give me some stories. Tell me some places you know that I might know where we've been. And he says, Tom, we've been everywhere. I can't single any country out because we've been everywhere. And I think he's right. You know, here in the Philippines, you know we were in the Philippines. Um, it was our first source um, for twine. Um, and we were using hemp rather than sisal back then. And when the Spanish-American War came along, things went crazy here in the Philippines, and prices like doubled or tripled. We backed out of there, and then we went to Mexico um, to buy our raw material for twine. But, but I love this photo. I've never seen this until last week. But right, right on the, you know, right on the, a boat holds up and loads up with hemp, and it's off to our, our mills. This is what it looked like, you know, when they're harvesting it. Um, I'm saying sisal here, and maybe later they use sisal, but that crop, that may be hemp, but I think that's sisal. So maybe the crops changed over years. I think we went back to the Philippines. I'm not sure. Um, but here in Manila, uh, a dealership in Manila, in the Philippines. Crazy stuff. And then later. I don't know again what model bus that is. We, like we did with most buses until we bought uh, the entire bus business, we were manufacturing the chassis for buses and, and bodybuilders were building the rest of the bus. But I don't like that, John. Um, Russia, this is one of our biggest, most complicated stories. Um, here's these three crates, which are, I used them in the Milestones book, but these are ready to ship, and this is from maybe 1900 or something, sitting on the dock in Chicago. One of these, the top one is going to Malmo, Sweden. The one on the bottom left is going to Odessa, Russia, and the one on the right at the bottom is going to Palestine. Um, you know, so hey, look how small. Look at, there's, there, that's, a, that's a little mower, it says, in that top box. And how, look at the dolly, it can't, that box can't be more than what, three or four foot square. It's just, it's, we were good. Um, so the Russia story, we went in early. We went in in 1858. We had agents trying to sell reapers. 
we left the country because there was a lot, a lot of pushback. It was social, it was religious. Uh, there was the, the surf system was still in place over there where it wasn't slavery, but a, a, a piece of farmland had a dedicated group of people that couldn't, the government wouldn't let you move to another farm. You were tied to that piece of property. Um, and the, the religious leaders didn't want us coming in and shaking up their way of life. It was, so we left, and so did Deering, so did everybody else. Um, we came back in 1879 when things started to change. That serfdom system was starting to erode. Um, besides that, there was a terrible uh, famine going on over there. They needed, they needed us to produce more food. It wasn't just uh, getting modern farm equipment. It was survival. It was we we would go and make demonstrations in Russia. Our sales guys and they the stories I've read is. They'd get a reception um, like they just won the Super Bowl. They'd come into a town and show modern farming equipment, and people would applaud because their neighbors in the next village had all died last year from famine. It was, it's just, it was, it was do or die, and uh, we were there at, at, at the right time. But quickly, we opened a branch house. Look at this, how many dealers we get. Like, we had 59 dealers, if you can imagine, um, in Russia. Um, you know, we, we built that plant, or we bought the plant and upgraded it uh, in Moscow. Okay, 1913, we were building 65,000 machines in Russia, mostly mowers. They had their own name for a, a, a reaper um, that I can't pronounce. And uh, all 65,000 machines were only one sixth of what we were selling over there. So. Machines were coming to Russia from Sweden, um, Chicago, and Canada. Uh, World War I begins, we enter the war, um, and the Bol Bolsheviks throw us out. But before that happened, um, okay, so, so this, is, this is one of those, a little out of sequence here, but th this is one of those stories, those recurring patterns. We go in, we explore, we, we pull out, we withdraw, and when dire circumstances set us up, we, we go back in. Um, but, and it happened in other places as well. But look at this, this graphic used to be hanging in our corporate headquarters, the original poster. Lee Grady went up there from the archives and saw it and swapped it out for a reproduction. But look at this, 1887, look at that, the, the operation, and it's it's not a generalized, fictitious thing. It's we know whose estate it was, where it was. Uh, we'd have a photo if there were there was photography back then. Um, I love this guy in his local garb. Um, and, and again, how are we how are we selling? We're winning awards, right? We're not doing national TV ads, right? We're not on the internet. We're we're winning local awards and talking about them. Camels. I can't imagine using a camel to pull up a piece of equipment, but that's how it was done. Here's our first tractor over there in 1910. And look at the turnout. I mean, it's this big, big deal. How do you pronounce that word? Yeah. <laughs> um, a, a dealership, you know, it looks like Ma and Pa and Grandma maybe and kids. There's the, there's the plant. This is just today. This is inside of Moscow. Back then, it was a, in a suburb of Moscow. Um, it was a big plant. Um, some of the employees, um, including the children, looks like advertising. Here's where our distributorships were. So imagine how big this country is. I mean, this is. Bigger than the United States. Fifteen minutes gone. You got two minutes left. Okay, I'm going really fast. Okay, so we went in with the root commission. Um, we tried to help our government figure out the situation over there. Um, we got on the um, 
train owned by the czar. He gave us his train. It was all our government guys. Did a study. We said, yeah, we think we know how to help uh, the Bolsheviks. And shortly after that, they threw us out, cleared out our plant, took it over. It's not that complicated. They threw out our employees, tried to keep our manager. He went away, came back. It's a complicated story. But, but then, then they called Donald Trump. <laughs> Um, you know, I think most of you know this story, but during World War II, um, we sent trucks to Russia and China as part of the Lend-Lease Act. Both those countries copied our KR-11. I wrote that article you may have read, but uh, you know, the, the Russians made something like 750,000 copies of our truck. I think we made 33,000 commercial copies or something. So. You know, it, it went on, and it went on to 1960, right? Uh, this is a terrible photo, but we opened a dealership um, and started selling new Pro Stars over there in 2013. We don't do that anymore, but we sell um, used Pro Stars over there. Those are our dealerships in Russia today. A lot of those trucks are trucks that we can't sell because of the emissions uh, standards here. Some of the trucks we got in trouble with, but they, they're perfectly fine trucks. You don't have to meet those emission standards. So we sell in places like Russia and Vietnam today. Um, the Soviet Union, a lot really happened there that I didn't know. Um, but we sold uh, crawler tractors. Uh, the Russian executives who met us at a trade show in Seattle and loved our equipment and bought a lot of it for their pipeline. In Belarus, we, we've been making engines for them at our uh, plant in Brazil for years and years. Um, and I think we've stopped doing that finally, but uh, maybe 10 or 15 years we made engines and sold thousands and thousands of them. They're in every tractor over there, it seems, and combine. Um, Panama, we don't have a lot here, but that's one of my favorite photos. That's the rebuilding of the Panama Canal just but two years ago, three years ago, uh, we were there. Uh, this is more of that, you know, not, not as dramatic a photo, but we were there. Uh, Germany, um, I've got to, I just got to go fast and long. Um, so first binder in 22, um, first tractors in 37, diesel engines, that's what the plant looked like. That's what the plant looked like inside. Uh, there's the first binder. Here's a, a branch house in Berlin. I love this photo. Um, uh, a convention, uh, you know, a, trade, a trade show back then. On the left, you can see uh, a McCormick board of parts demonstration over here. On the right, a, a Deering one. This is when we expanded the plant in 1937 and invited, you know, executives come to the opening. And who do you see there but two Nazi officers standing there. Um, I, I look, I'm, I'm not really a historian. I'm a graphic designer. But I, I look what, what the Nazis were doing back then and it isn't like we didn't know. They, they were they were doing terrible things by 1937. They were doing terrible things by 1933. But I, I guess if you're there, you either let them in or don't know what you do. I don't know how you protest them. You know, they needed us to make tractors. New tractors, new tractors, newer trucks, newer tractors. Here's a, a few things we made in Germany. Look at that poster. I mean, it's got scouts, construction equipment, Engines, tractors, combines, all kinds of farm equipment. Okay, here, here's Bond's question from earlier. By 1883, what country after the U.S. had, had the next largest uh, wheat crop? Russia. Hmm? Russia. Australia. Australia. Argentina. What else? Russia. 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 I, I, those are all. Good, good guesses. No. No, I was guessing all of those. Australia. No, should, should have been, could have been. Ready? Canada. No, should have been me. 
France. So who doesn't, who doesn't want that? That, that just it boggles my mind. But, um, you know, things changed quickly, but in 1883, France was the second largest. I guess French bread, right? We all need good French bread. So that's all I can put to that. Um, again, like we did everywhere else, we competed and we won awards to promote ourselves. Um, here at a dealership or the corporate headquarters for the French company. Um, advertising, local advertising. And so here, the French were also selling in Tunisia, in, you know, in Africa. Um, plant I didn't know about, um, probably should have, but didn't know about. Croix plant. Look at the size of the twine mill. Boggles my mind, but twine mill, what is that, three or four stories high? And city block long. This is one of my favorite photos. We don't own this photo, but um, those are our half tracks built in the Springfield, Ohio plant. Uh, and that's Charles de Gaulle uh, inspecting the Allied troops after the, the Allies retake Paris from the Nazis. That's, that's history, guys. That's, we were there, we were amongst it all. Another plant, tractor plant in France. And that plant, newer photos of the same place. Yumbo, I knew very little about Yumbo, but construction equipment. And look, so we're making construction equipment in France, and we're exporting to Iraq, to China, and Madagascar. So everything we went outside of the country, and then those countries went to other countries. It's a real network. South Africa, one of the biggest operations we had anywhere. We went in um, early. Um, it's a dealership. Here's a binder. Just but look at those costumes. Look at their, not costumes, look at the clothing. It's just, that's authentic stuff. Another one of those scenics. And red babies. Back in the 20s. Nice truck, Paul Scott. The Paul Scott's of the, the, the Hoover Dam. Assembly plant in Durban. Big. Look, so, so here are the, the knockdown kits. Here are the kits. What they spawn? The CK, CKD. CKD is over here on the left. The trucks come in in crates. They get assembled here, kind of slowly it looks like, and manually, but they get there. Here's a great story, but we don't have time, but here's a, a crawler tractor doing heavy duty work. The guy behind him has oxen and a, what is that called, a scoop. Hmm? Yeah, but isn't that just, that, that's one of those Cyrus stories of advancing civilization, right there in one picture. Um, here's those trucks. Those specific trucks built in Canada, here they are in South Africa. So there's three trucks pulling and one pushing, and what, 198 wheel trailer. That's just a remarkable photo to me. There's our plans. Here's this until recently, until 2013, we were assembling trucks. Today we just sell parts and service trucks in South Africa. Um, but we were selling these cab over trucks over there. We were built in Brazil and assembled over there. Uh, and we shipped trucks that we built here, or in Mexico, over there. Sweden, great dealership photo. Uh, one of those fairs. Uh, remember the crate from uh, Malmo, Sweden? There's the dealership it was going to. Plant. Great Britain. I have very little records of what we did in Great Britain. And I either I'm not a good researcher or I just missed it or we don't have it recorded. But um, you know, the advertising tells some of the stories. First farm all them. Uh, there's the plant, but you know, it's a fuzzy photograph out of Harvest the World. Another one. Trade show. 
I think this is hand colored and hand colored incorrectly because I don't know us ever having a, a yellow and blue and red IH logo anywhere. But, but then you look at the clothing, you kind of get the idea that it's some artist's version of what it might have looked like. Here in Great Britain, you know, building construction equipment, but then shipping to Australia. So ship from Britain to Australia. Um, Mexico. We were there for years uh, getting twine. I wrote that article about us getting uh, thrown out. And we, you know the story about the, the counterfeit pesos we were paid um, during the revolution down there. It's a great story, but I don't have the time for it here. Um, you know, just equipment at work. Beautiful, beautiful place. <coughs> um, our first plant down there built trucks and tractors. Juan, you were there? Yeah. yeah. And walk behind cultivators. Walk behind cultivators. Advertising. I got to go faster. Dealerships in 1980. Today, or recently, uh, we've our, our biggest plant is down there. Um, Award winning. It's, we build all our biggest trucks down there. Quite a place. Uh, Turkey. I didn't know this much about Turkey as I discovered here. Uh, equipment. So that <coughs> Turkey Automotive Enterprises for industrial, I guess. Uh, all kinds of these pickup trucks. And what is they call it? The end? pickup. Pickup. Here, I'll show you in a minute. Dealership sign, the, the sign is from um, Greg Swanson. There it is. Peacock. See on the, on, the, on the pylon sign there? Peacock. Tractors. Uh, I don't know what that bus is. We must have made the, other than sticking an IH on the front, we, we must have made the chassis, but I've never seen that before. There, here are the peacocks. Uh, but all kinds of there. Argentina, early 1900s. <coughs> Lots of beautiful advertising. I mean, look at the scale of what they're suggesting over here on the right, the, the gearing machine. I mean, a lot of room in Argentina. This I didn't know about the sales and truck center here on the, on the right. Combine. Eight horsepower. Eight horsepower combine. Um, today in Argentina we have an engine plant. Brazil, I think the ad on the right here is for America, but talking about Rio. The, the one on the left is an ad, local ad. Um, we have an engine plant there. China, this is a, another one of those stories we had to find out how to sell in China. I'll have to go fast, but um, we had a, a house, uh, we had an advertising. This, I, this stuff is all brand new to me that I discovered doing this presentation. We were selling stuff over in China way early on, which I, I had not heard about. But we were in the wheat producing countries of the world. Um, the way it worked, maybe we sold to China, is we had to educate them on modern farming. They had no, we couldn't just deliver tractors here you go guys, good luck. We had to teach them. So we set up workshops. We invited students to come from China to the US. We went over there and taught. Um, and this is, we, we also did this kind of thing in Iceland. We have a photo here a little bit of a, a tractor school in Iceland, because you can't just for the first time deliver a boatload of tractors and say, you know, here you go. You have to teach them how to work with the tractor. Um, so we got a lot of big deals. We learned to work with the government and it paid off for us. Um, here's modern advertising in China, selling trucks and farm equipment, construction equipment. There's Brooks McCormick there, probably with an ambassador, I'm sure. And more truck brochures in Chinese. Uh, we were at a big trade show in 2012 over there. Um, here you can see on the right, 
the, the truck they worship, that KR-11 from World War II, that's ours, that to them is like, their copy of that is the first motorized vehicle made in China. At First Auto Works in China, they have their copy of that truck on a, a marble monument that's crazy large out in front of the plant. It's all done? Okay, you guys can run away when you want, but I'm gonna keep going here for a bit. But today we have a joint venture and we build engines in China. Um, and this is this was taken in our lobby, I took this photo because I couldn't understand it. So this is a truck our engine partner makes in China. It has a Cummins Chinese engine in it, not a JAC, who's our partner. So JAC builds this truck and puts a competitor's engine in it, puts it in a kit and ships it, and we sell it to Mexico, only in Mexico. So talk about truly international. We're, we're everywhere. In Japan, our Bond was showing this, did I tell this story? I, I did, yeah. So Mom was showing this. This guy didn't know that we were, I didn't know we were in Japan this early, but we were. And how do you sell to the Japanese trying to sell farm equipment? You know, you give them 10-gallon hats and you give them uh, bullhorns and you let them drive the combine and it's, you know, they want to be American, I guess, or they love America and that is apparently how we did it. Advertising looks like it's 100 years old, but it's only from the 70s. But I had no idea about this. And I didn't know about the joint venture we had over there. Um, I love the, the ID plate on the equipment over there, all the Japanese. Cuba, this is a story that's still going on today. Um, we had a plantation growing sisal down there, 4,300 acres in Cuba. Um, you know, for the twine business. Um, we also threw a big meeting over there, a big international sales meeting in Cuba. Um, so uh, obviously Castro threw us out in 59. Our legal department's working with the State Department today. We're trying to get our money back. Um, and even if we only get 10 cents on the dollar, we'll get a lot of money out of Cuba, we hope. But that's what our size is plantation. You know, the, all the workers' houses were little shacks along the shoreline back then, and today it's a luxury resort. Um, that's more of the plot of the, the land there. This was our warehouse in Havana where the sisal was kept before it was shipped, and it's still there. We have a, a city square block in downtown Havana, which has to be worth some money. India, I don't have a very good or complete story here, but we were there early. We made a deal with Mahindra, new tractors in the 60s. Um, that's just a beautiful painting of one of our trucks back in the 20s. In the 60s, this is the product that we built over there. Um, and this is one of those photos that, again, does the McCormick thing, the uh, cultural, you know, bringing modern culture to the world. We had a joint venture with them. 2005 to 13 in India, building engines and trucks. There's the truck plant that we've since sold that business back. But we built these trucks over there. Uh, Vietnam, love this photo. I've never seen this. A scout at work hauling rice and loading onto the, an army helicopter in Vietnam. That's, to me, that's real history. That's like bringing me right to the middle of it all. Uh, we, of course, brought lots of construction equipment over there. Um, today, we're selling used Pro Stars over there in Vietnam. And other trucks. Jordan, here's just one shot of Jordan, 1962. The king of Jordan, his choice vehicle is a scout. New Zealand, I don't know how much time I'm, I don't have, I'm all out of time, so I'll go fast. But dealerships, posters, I love this shot. I don't know what that tractor is, but it's, Looks like he modified it or something. There's no radiator. It's an 
this I love again, one of these fairs. I think you can see them, uh, International Harvester Company, and then of NC New Zealand. Look at the scale of that. And then, <laughs> I, I have a collection of photos of overloaded trucks. I, I use my stories to say why we kept building bigger trucks. And this has to be the king of them all. This is, I can't imagine that truck got out of that place. Look at that. Juan found that for me. Thank you. Um, today we have a, a deal with, well, with Intertruck. Um, they built twin steers over there. The caps are stamped in Brazil still. <coughs> the trucks are built pretty much, as you can see here, from the ground up over there. It looks like every time they build one, it's a little different. Look at this grill. Look at that grill. I, you know, Iceland, I've got almost almost nothing, but I had a stamp, so I knew we must have been selling tractors over there. Here's that story again where you, we, we teach. We go over and we bring tractors and we have a school on how to use a tractor. Mongolia, I don't know much except we have a stamp from Mongolia. So let me start with the first was uh, what was the first non United States plant built by International Marks after the corporation? Where was it? Canada. 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 Where at Canada? Anybody have the answer? Hamilton. 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 Give both prizes. That was pretty close. <laughs> okay, that was a practice question. I'm good. That was a practice question. Which overseas subsidiary exported the most to the most countries? Well, that's stuck. Good job. Huh? All right, now we have to give a prize for that. So you can choose one of the two up there. Not, not his bottle of water. <laughs> what is this, Fun? Uh, that's a sock. That's a uh, insulated cup. Okay. So pick one of those. Let it come for a black. Or, uh, oh, yeah. Windsock. Yeah, Windsock. I eat Windsock. If you have an airplane, it's a nice way to know if you can fly. <laughs> uh, so who's our win? He is. Huh? Yeah. Cup. 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 Okay, question number three. We got enough? Yeah, we do. We got one more. Yeah. Name two IH foreign operations that were taken over by a hostile regime. Name the countries. Cuba. Russia. Russia is not Cuba. Russia. Russia is one. Germany. Germany is the other. Now we're in big heap of trouble here. <laughs> right? Well, I thought it was Cuba and Russia. But it was Russia and Germany. Oh, could, you know, you're right. I'm sorry. We said Cuba. But Cuba is right. And the other one is Russia. Russia. So you guys are going to have to split that windsock. <laughs> <laughs>